Let's pray this morning, guys, for the word of God. We already dismissed the children. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus for your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, for the precious Spirit of God that gives life. Father, we pray for the families who are out sick today, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would touch them, raise them up, bring health and healing to them. Father, we pray, Jesus, that this sickness will pass from them quickly in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, for Gary and his wife who suffered that car accident, Father, be with them, be with her, Lord. Bring a spirit, a supernatural, Lord God, uh, healing to her body as well in the name of Jesus Christ, Father God. Father, I pray a spirit of encouragement, a spirit of grace and peace and comfort over them, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. And Father, we thank you, Lord God, that in times of difficulty, you're always there with us, Lord God. Father, just continue to protect your people always in the name of Jesus. And all of God's people said, amen, amen and amen. So the title of my message today is called Avoiding Deception in the End Times. How many of you think there's a little bit of deception out there? How many of you know we're in the election season and there's deception everywhere about everything? I'm not going to get political but I just want you to know that the devil is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And he devours people because of deception, because of lies. He started with a lie in the garden, and he's going to end things with a lie. And you and I need to be watchful in these last days. Amen? Last week, as we go through a quick little review, we learned that there's a critical difference between true worship and idolatry or false worship, even when the same name of God is invoked. Amen? We talked about how just because they called that golden calf in the Hebrew, yod heh vuv or Yahweh, did not make the golden calf Yahweh. But they called it that. They worshipped it. Anybody who worships a god who is represented differently than our God represents himself in the word of God is not our God. Someone say amen. Even if he goes by the same name, G-O-D, even if he's invisible, none of that matters. Amen. I don't worship the same God as the Muslims. Just so you know. They might claim him to be the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but the God they represent is the exact opposite and says the exact opposite of what our God says. So he's not my God. He is a golden calf that they've called Yahweh. No different. We also learned, I can't see that. We also learned that true worship produces holiness, righteousness, and a life that honors God. Amen? How many of you know Heavenly Father wants every aspect of our life to honor Him? Amen? As a pastor, I was thinking about this this week, and I think it was um, A.W. Tozer said this. He said, uh, we need not be so concerned with filling the church with people as we need to be concerned as filling people with God. And I love that. Amen? I really love that. We need to be spirit born, spirit-led men and women of righteousness in these last days. Amen? And lastly, and this is on YouTube, you're welcome to check it out if you missed last week, we learned that misrepresenting God, even with the right name, is akin to idolatry and false worship. Amen? I mentioned how there's a uh, woman who is very popular on social media who sings beautiful worship songs and has a beautiful voice. But she's not singing to our God, she's singing to her God. And believers are joining in and giving her all kinds of praise and everything else. And we need to be super careful in these days. Because I can envision, and I want you to hear me, I can envision the day coming when stadiums around the world will be filled with Muslims and people that purport themselves to be Christians worshiping together, and they'll claim to be worshiped the same God, and it's going to be Antichrist. I could almost preach that again, couldn't I? That was a good word. 
Introduction today. Where is my introduction? It has disappeared. <clears throat> Avoiding the deception. There are two ways to be fooled, Soren Kierkegaard said. And he was a uh, Dutch minister, a theologian from, uh, I guess you'd call him a Great Dane, huh? <laughs> he was Danish. There are two ways. Where's Gabe when I need him? There are two ways to be fooled. One is to believe what isn't true. The other is to refuse to accept what is true. Let that sink in. So I want to start this morning out of 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13-15. through 15. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves, the Apostle Paul, by the Spirit, into apostles of Christ. He's speaking to the church of Corinth. And he's speaking about these men who've come in. And he's talking about them being false apostles. Everybody say false apostles. Deceitful workers. Transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into what? an angel of light. So if you recall along this line, I said last week that Joseph Smith in the 1800s, um, what was it, 1823, something like that, uh, claims, and he may have really seen an angel named Moroni who came and spoke to him and spoke to him all these things. The only problem was what he spoke to him is opposite and contrary to the Scripture. Then we talked about Muhammad, who also had an angel come and visit him and give him all of what they call their Scripture. And we talked about how even if an angel who says he's from God comes to you with any other good news other than that which has been delivered to you, let him be accursed. Anathema. Everybody say accursed. Accursed. There's only one good news, only one Jesus. Someone say amen. Now I say this because there are false Christ and false apostles everywhere, guys, and they creep into the church. They love coming to church, just so you know. It's almost like child predators in modern times who love coming to church. Why? Because they see it as an easy place. By the way, we're super, super cautious with your children, just so you know, above and beyond. Amen. Um, because they look for a place where they can do their wicked deeds. So Satan himself has these false apostles, false prophets, who transform themselves into angels of light. In other words, if you were just looking at them outwardly, you'd think, wow, that's just the most spiritual man or woman of God I've ever seen in my life. They're just something amazing. Therefore, it's no great thing, still speaking of these, Satan himself transforming himself into an angel of light, therefore it's no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of what? Righteousness. Listen, guys, there are ministers who pretend to be ministers of righteousness who are ministers of Satan. Just so you know, everywhere. And then there are ministers of righteousness. You say, well, how do we know the difference? Well, we're going to look at that today. It's kind of important, amen? The temptation of Eve. Satan disguised himself as a serpent. Appeared to offer Eve wisdom and enlightenment. Did Satan as the serpent come to Eve and say, Eve, I want you to listen to me because when you do, you and your husband are both going to die horrible spiritual deaths and be separated from God. No, he came offering what? Wisdom and enlightenment. Eve, you can be like God. You can know the difference between good and evil like God does. You can be just like him. So he always comes disguising himself. Someone say amen. He also gives half-truths by twisting God's word. Twisting them. 
Now, how many of you know that it's important to read God's Word in context? Amen? And some scriptures, the main scriptures there are, that are cross-referenced throughout the scripture. I think they say there's like 65,000 cross-references of scripture. But Satan actually takes the Word of God and twists it to mean something it never means. Didn't he do that with Jesus? If you're the Son of God... Just dive off the top of the temple and the angels are going to catch you. Is it not written that they shall be with you and catch you lest you stub your toe? And Jesus is like, uh, that's kind of the scripture with the twist because thou shalt not tempt the Lord your God. Amen? Someone say amen. amen. How many of you know it's like the snake handlers out there in Appalachia? And there's a couple... Churches that still do that crazy stuff. And to me, it's tempting the Spirit of God. Now, if you're out in the woods and you get bit by a snake like the Apostle Paul, then you're going to stand on the Word of God that if you get bit, nothing by any means is going to hurt you. And you just shake that thing off and keep going. Amen? But if you purposely are tempting Christ by like playing with snakes, that's just crazy in my mind, right? So the devil's always trying to twist the Word of God. And how many of you know 90% truth and 10% lie is heresy? False teachers who work for Satan often present themselves as righteous spiritual leaders, but their works deny them. We have to have good works, amen? If you as a believer claim to be a believer in Jesus, somebody should look at your life and there should be righteous works about your life. Amen? Plain and simple. Righteous works about your life. And so false teachers who work for Satan present themselves as ministers of light, but their works deny them. They're caught up in covetousness or evil or there's a zillion things that it can be. Amen? False teachers may preach some elements of biblical truth, but they weave in false doctrines, deceiving many who fail to discern between truth and lies. And I think I shared with you guys, when I first got saved, I got saved in a large church, 3,000 people. But the reason it was so large is because what they preached. They preached a prosperity gospel, that God's going to make you rich and give you swimming pools. And man, you follow God, you're going to be driving beautiful BMWs. And if you're driving a clunker, then you're just not walking and living right for God. And, you know, uh, it sounds crazy now, but that was the thing. And I got saved. They're still preaching the Word enough to where I got saved, Pastor Brian, Pastor Carl. I got saved there, but you know what? Uh, it took a while for the Holy Spirit to show me that there was some error there. And wait a minute. <laughs> the Gospel's not about making my flesh feel good. Amen. It's not about me catching gold in service and putting it in my pockets. Amen? I'm, I'm being messy now. <clears throat> it's about me laying down my life for the kingdom of God and for the lordship of Jesus Christ. Amen? That's what it's about. So false doctrine appeals to the flesh. Uh, Self-helps, all that stuff, guys. And people don't really want to listen to the truth because the truth makes your flesh feel uncomfortable. You ever see people feel uncomfortable in church? They just can't sit still. Can't sit under the Word of God. Why? Their flesh is uncomfortable. I know. Been there, done that. Their flesh is uncomfortable because the Word of God's trying to put that thing to death. And it doesn't want to die easy, does it? They promote messages that appeal to the flesh, such as prosperity without sacrifice, freedom without holiness, blessing without obedience. God just wants to bless your life like God's some Las Vegas jukebox. You just put in the coin and flip the switch and out comes the blessing of God. And when you read through a scripture, you realize there are blessings of God, but he actually requires some accountability and responsibility for my life. Matter of fact, a lot. Matter of fact, all of it. Well, they didn't tell me that when I first got saved. They told me I was going to follow Jesus and get rich. <laughs> it's been a battle for 42 years. 
Now, there is truth to God prospering us, but you know what I'm saying, taking things to extreme. That's me. It could be anything. There's so much... Listen, guys, there's so much out there that's not centered on Jesus Christ. I can't even keep up with it all. Pastor, have you heard about the newest thing? No. And I try to stay focused on Jesus, and I'm doing good. Amen? Everything done that comes along doesn't look like the Lord. I recognize it pretty quick. Amen? I recognize it pretty quick. Y'all with me? Amen. Now, y'all hang in there. We got a good lunch for you. We don't just have fried chicken. We got roasted corn on a cob, thanks to Brother Lupe. And I made some Cajun red beans to melt your socks off. And y'all made some good fixings. So y'all just bear with me. We're not. We're going to get done and the Holy Spirit's going to bless our lives today. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God. Uh-oh, I've got to do something? I've got to put on the whole armor of God? I thought when I wake up, God just, if He wants me to have it, He's just going to dump it on me. Isn't that the way Christianity works, right? God just dumps stuff on us? No, it says for me to put on the whole armor of God, for you to put on the whole armor of God. Why? That you and I may be able to stand against the wiles, the schemes, the methodology of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. How many of you ever found that you started doing a real work for God or really started, man, just bearing into the kingdom of God, bearing into Christ, bearing it in your prayer life and the scripture, and it's like all of a sudden things are just looking worse instead of better. That's because the devil's trying to do everything he can to discourage you in your life. That's when you need to press in even more. Get your eyes off of circumstances and put them on Jesus. Amen? If you based on circumstances, man, Paul would have thought he was the worst believer in the history of believers. And out of the will of God always. That man was shipwrecked, beaten, stoned. Well, he must be not doing something right for Christ or he'd be just living a prosperous life. <laughs> just not true, right? We're in a battle, guys. Everybody say a battle. battle. And the battle's real. I'm so proud of our evangelism team. You know, our evangelism team's been going out, and some of you want to go out with them, but uh, <clears throat> reading some of their testimonies, man, they've been doing some real deliverance, casting out real demons. And uh, these demons aren't happy, but they've been walking the power and authority of Jesus Christ. And to me, that's exciting, amen? Because that's how you learn to do the stuff, is doing the stuff. How do we stand against the wiles, the schemes, the methods, the plans of Satan? How do we do it? Know the Word of God. Everybody say, know the Word of God. Know the Word of God. Know the Word of God. Live the Word of God. Obey the Word of God. Act on the Word of God. The Scripture says, Your Word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Did you know in the old days they used to have these little oil lamps before they had flashlights? And these oil lamps, they actually tied to the top of your feet. So when you were walking, you could see the path that you were on. Now, you couldn't. it wasn't like a 15,000 lumens flashlight today where you aim it at a forest and it like is igniting the trees on fire. It was just a little oil lamp, but it was enough to see the path that they were walking and to dispel the darkness. That's what it's talking about in Psalm 119.105, where it says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. In other words, as I walk this thing out, the word of God is going to make light our path and show us where to walk. Amen? Beautiful thing. Knowing God's Word helps believers recognize when the devil twists it. He is a twister. How many of you remember that old kids game, Twister? You ever play that before? But when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all truth. Everybody say all truth. Not some of the truth, not partial truth, but into all truth. That word all is important. John 16, 13 the Holy Spirit of God leads us into all truth and alerts you and I to deception. Amen. 
to deception. I think it was Pastor Brian, we were at breakfast this past week, and I think you were telling me a story about the dogs that alert to melatonin levels, right? Cortisol levels. Uh, when, when somebody's like overly stressed to the point of maybe committing suicide, these dogs have been trained, well, they'll alert to that. They'll alert to it. And I was thinking, you know, the Holy Spirit alerts you and I inside in our gut that there's deception. There's something not right. Can't put my finger on it, but there's something. Everybody say something. And then you walk through and you get with the Scripture and the Holy Spirit and all of a sudden the Word of God makes things plain. Amen? Test all things. Everybody say test all things. Hold fast what is good. 1 Thessalonians 5.21 We are called to test and discern everything to avoid falling into Satan's traps. Amen? Test it all. Take home my messages. Listen to them again. Make sure I'm actually preaching the gospel. Amen? Thank you, Cecil. 1 Kings 13.1 Alright, so now, listen. All that was a warm-up. Everybody say a warm-up. That was free. That was to prepare you for this message. And the message is this. I call it the battle between the prophets. There is a very unusual story in the Old Testament in 1 Kings chapter 13. And I'm not going to read the entire story because of time. So I'm going to kind of jump around and jump through time in the story, but you can read the entirety on your own time. And this unusual story, I've been reading it since I was first a Christian, and it's only in these days where I've really begun to see deeper. How many of you can read the same thing in Scripture over and over again, but all of a sudden you start seeing things in a deeper, more in-depth, the Holy Spirit starts giving you revelation of understanding, revelation of knowledge, amen? So here we are in 1 Kings chapter 13. If you have your Bibles, you're welcome to turn with me there. 1 Kings chapter 13, and I want to start in verse 1. And behold, a man of God went from Judah to Bethel by the word of the Lord. And Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. So let me give you some background where we're at. So at this time in Israel's history, Israel's had a civil war. And they've divided their country into the southern nation of Judah and the northern nation of Israel. The problem is when they did that, it created a lot of idolatry, or I should say the people in the northern tribes turned to idolatry because remember, they were supposed to come to Jerusalem to worship. Well, Jerusalem was no longer a part of their recognized country because they'd had a falling out. So the last thing they wanted to do is be obedient to the Word of God and go to Jerusalem to worship. And so they began to set up their own high places and set up and establish their own religion. So that's in the northern tribes. At this time, Jerusalem is the capital of Judah, just like today it's the capital of all of Israel. And Bethel is the capital of the northern nation of Israel. At this time, Rehoboam, the son of King Solomon, is the king of Judah, and Jeroboam is the king of the northern tribes of Israel. Everybody follow me so far? So a man of God, a prophet of God, goes from Judah, remember the civil war, this own nation, comes to the nation of Israel, the northern nation now, to the new capital of this northern nation called Bethel. And that's where we pick up the story. Everybody follow me? God told him to go. Everybody say, God told him to go. So this wasn't him just doing this. God told him, go to Bethel and give and deliver the word of the Lord. We skip down to verse 5. So it came to pass when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God. And the man of God prophesied against their false altar there in Bethel. Because remember, the altar was where? In Jerusalem. Okay, it was in Jerusalem at the temple. They built their own altar, doing their own thing. So the man of God had cried out against the altar. And King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God who cried out against the altar in Bethel. 
that he stretched out his hand from the altar, saying, Arrest him. Then his hand, which he stretched out toward this man of God, it never gives us a name, just a man of God from Judah, they stretched out toward him, withered, so he couldn't even pull it back to himself. Can you imagine the king of the nation of the northern tribes of Israel stretching out his hand because he didn't like what the man, the prophet of God from Judah, came and said about the altar. They're dedicating this new altar. So he stretches out his hand, and just as he stretches out his hand and says, arrest him, his hand withers in front of everybody. Can you imagine? And he can't even pull his hand back. It's like stuck in place. And it's all withered up. The altar also splits apart. This is supernatural stuff. The altar was like a giant barbecue pit where you put the sacrifices on. Everybody follow me? So this altar splits apart. Ashes poured out from the altar according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. The prophet from Judah had just come and prophesied this was going to happen. And just as he said it, it happened immediately. I mean, there was no waiting 10 years. I mean, it was immediate when it happened. How many of you know, everybody there was astonished, but they knew God had spoken through this man. Now that's where the story should have ended. But false prophets, everybody say false prophets, are out to deceive, to steal, to rob, to kill, to do Satan's work. And that's what we have here, an interesting story. So now we come to 1 Kings 13, verse 8 through 10. But the man of God said to the king, because the king offered, you know, his hands with her, offered him and said, hey, let me give you a reward. Let me take you home. Let me feed you. Uh, he's trying to make nice with the man of God. But the man of God from Judah said to the king, who's the king of the northern tribes of Israel, Jeroboam, if you were to give me half your house, I would not go in with you, nor would I eat bread nor drink water in this place. For so, this is why, it was commanded me by the word of the Lord, saying, You shall not eat bread, nor drink water, nor return the same way you came. God himself, everybody say God himself. This is super important because you're going to see why it's so important here in a little bit. Heavenly Father himself spoke to this prophet, this man from Judah, and said, go and say this to Jeroboam, and afterwards, don't eat bread, don't drink water, don't even return the same way you came. It was a command from the Lord to this prophet. Everybody understand it? Verse 10. So he went another way and did not return by the way he came to Bethel. So far, the prophet of God, the man of God from Judah, is doing everything that the Holy Spirit commanded him. Someone say amen. How many of you know the devil comes to rob, to steal, to kill, and to destroy, to lie to you, to lie to me, to get us off the purpose and off the plan that God has for our life so he can kill us and destroy us? 1 Kings 13, verse 11 through 12. Now an old prophet dwelt in Bethel, and his sons came and told him all the works that the man of God had done that day in Bethel. They also told their father the words which he had spoken to the king. Now this took me a long time to understand. This prophet was in Bethel. He was in the northern tribes of Israel. God didn't tell him to go speak to Jeroboam. God told the prophet from Judah, gave him the word of the Lord. How many of you think there might have been a little animosity in this man's heart when he heard that a prophet from Judah came all the way to Bethel, delivered a word of God, and God did miracles by his hand, split the altar, withered the king's hand. All those things happened just like God said. So this old prophet, he's thinking, well, why in the world didn't God ask me to do that? Let's find out if I'm right. So the old prophet dwelt in Bethel. He lives there in the same city. And his sons came, told him all the works that the man of God had done that day in Bethel. They also told their father the words which he had spoken to the king. And their father said to them, which way did he go? Maybe the old prophet wants to congratulate him. 
Maybe the old prophet once said, man, I'm so glad even though you're from Judah that you heard from God. I'm so excited. How many of you know that pride is one of the deadliest sins of all? Someone say amen. And their father says, which way did he go? For his sons had seen which way the man of God went who came from Judah. <clears throat> then we skip down verse 14. He went after the man of God. Remember this, the old prophet from Bethel going after the man of God found him sitting under an oak and said to him, are you the man of God who came from where? Judah. Judah. Did he know he came from Judah? Yes, he did. Where was he from? Bethel. He was the old prophet. Why didn't God use me that way? Are you the man of God came from Judah? He said, I am. Then he said to him, come home with me and eat bread. Well, that's the same thing the king Jeroboam had said to him. And remember what the man of God from Judah had said. And he said, I cannot return with you, nor go in with you, neither can I eat bread nor drink water with you in this place. For I have been told by the word of the Lord, you shall not eat bread nor drink water there, nor return by going the way you came. God made it pretty plain to him what to do. Someone say amen. Are you with me? We're getting somewhere. Here it is, verse 18. So the old prophet from Bethel said to him, I too am as prophet as you are. And an angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord saying, bring him back with you to your house that he may eat bread and drink water. He was what? Lying to him. Now, the last time I checked, Satan is the author of all lies. And so this old prophet, he's like, you know what? <laughs> he's, like, he's like Balaam. I can't curse him, but I can sure get him off track where God curses him himself. Just opens the door and lets the devil come in. So he claims to have seen an angel who spoke the exact opposite to him of what God himself spoke by the Spirit to the prophet. Wow, who's that sound like? Sounds like those other false religions I told you about, right? Claiming that an angel spoke to them, even if an angel did speak to them. Any angel that speaks contrary to your Scripture is not of God. I don't care if he shows up here in a flaming sword and looking all cool. If he comes speaking words contrary to the word of God, that thing's getting rebuked. Amen? Are you following me? So, this old prophet says, hey, I'm a prophet too. I had an angelic visitation. I love all these people that see angels and talk to angels all the time been this 42 years and i'm not saying it couldn't happen i'm just saying that angel if he shows up he better be speaking god's word because i'm going to know it amen and so he says hey this angel talked to me and said it's okay you can go back with this old prophet you can trust me kind of reminds me what satan said to eve right you can trust me just eat it. It'll be good for you. Give you wisdom. You'll be like God. Listen, guys. It's sad, but it's kind of funny, but it's really sad. It's heartbreaking because I'll tell you why. The devil does the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over again. He just does it in different ways. And he's been doing it for a really long time. He's very subtle. Right? Isn't that what they said about serpents more subtle than all the beasts of the field? He's very subtle. Let's find out what happened. This, saints, is a powerful lesson on the importance of listening to God's voice. Remaining steadfast. Everybody say steadfast. Steadfast in obedience despite the deception or persuasion of others. There's a whole movement out there trying to talk people out of being a part of church. Here's another movement out there trying to talk people out of supporting their church. All these things contrary to the Word of God. <clears throat> Why? Because the devil is like a roaring lion. And I think God's about to move mightily in our nation. 
I'm just telling you, I believe that. I believe that. I see stirrings. I've been seeing stirrings. And uh, it may actually start in California, which really needs it. Of all the darkest places, I can't think of a better place for it to start, seriously, than California. There have been stirrings there, honestly. That I read about even this week. People just mass baptisms still going on there. People giving their hearts to the Lord. Um, just been, it gives me chills. I'm excited. So don't think it's strange that there's been an attack on the body of Christ. We met with a man, Pastor Carl and I, um, in our pastor's prayer meeting this past Wednesday, who was telling us about some of the attacks going on uh, nationwide against churches and their staff and people falling to sin and unrighteous and all this kind of stuff that's going and it's like everywhere everywhere and i think god's cleaning house to prepare for what's coming amen for what's coming he gives people a chance to repent how many of you know that but how many of you know if we don't then he steps it up to the next level that's what happened to this man of god as we're going to see in a minute the old prophet lied about an angel speaking to him with contrary instructions. If you heard from God about something and an angel of God or somebody claiming to be a prophet of God tells you contrary or opposite, listen to the Holy Spirit. Don't listen to them. Someone say amen. amen. I've wrestled more with that this last year than any other time in 42 years of ministry. And it's going to get worse, not better. The Bible says that even the Antichrist, when he shows up on the scene, is going to have the false prophet there showing signs and wonders. But they're all lies. Even calling fire down out of heaven to deceive the masses. God's word is never overruled by angelic visitations. It's not overruled by dreams or any other supernatural events. Amen? I've heard people have dreams of, well, I went to heaven and there was warehouses full of body parts. And I saw all these, I'm being serious. And listen, all I know is I can't find that in Scripture. Amen? So my idea of heaven right now is what Scripture says. And no offense, if you have a dream and doesn't line up with Scripture, I'll listen, but I'm not going to take it face value because the Scripture is my foundation. Amen? amen. Someone say amen. amen. So God's words never overruled by angelic visitations, dreams, or any other supernatural events. Perhaps pride. That's what I think after all these years of studying it out. Can't prove it, of course. But my gut feeling, my thought, that I believe I have the Spirit of God on this, is that pride motivated the old prophet. Pride causes much false prophecy and false prophets in the kingdom of God. It just does. They want to be seen of men. Well, we want to operate in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Someone say amen. But love is supposed to be our motivation. Never to be seen of men. That should never be our motivation. Someone say amen. Back to our old prophet, young prophet. Prophet of Judah, old prophet from Bethel, tricking this guy. So when the man, the young man, the young prophet from Judah, goes to the house with the old prophet in Bethel to eat and he's drinking, all of a sudden now the old prophet's going to cry out and prophesy against him. And cries out to the man of God who came from Judah saying, Thus says the Lord, because you have disobeyed the word of the Lord and have not kept the commandment which the Lord your God commanded you, but you came back, ate bread, and drank water in the place of which the Lord said to you, Eat no bread and drink no water. Your corpse shall not come back to the tomb, shall not come to the tomb of your fathers. Wow. Dangerous stuff, right? This young prophet, man, he was just doing his best to obey God. Probably young, we know he's younger than the old prophet. He came, saw the mighty hand of God, but he got off track when he listened to somebody say angelic visitation and allowed that to overrule the Spirit of God. How many believers do I know have allowed their faith to fall subject to false prophecies, false dreams, and false faith. 
Even to the point where they don't even serve Christ to this day. It's heartbreaking. Everybody say heartbreaking. I don't want to end up like that young prophet from Judah. Amen? I want to hear the word of the Lord, know the word of the Lord for myself, from the Holy Spirit, and it doesn't matter if an angel himself appears, I'm going to do what God said. Amen? So what happened? So it was after he had eaten bread, after he had drunk, he saddled the donkey by him, the prophet whom he had brought back. When he was gone, a lion met him on the road and killed him. Everybody say that's sad. Now, the Bible says these things are written for an example for our lives. It says that in the book of Hebrews, right? That the things of the Old Testament are written as examples for us. And this is a man who you can say represents anybody who once was listening to the voice of God and has gone off track because of anything other than what the Spirit of God has said to them. It's a dangerous place to be. Everybody say dangerous. Why? Because our fight's not with flesh and blood. Who's our fight with? The devil with principalities, powers, the rulers of the darkness in high places, wickedness in high places. Amen? Coming in for a landing here. Galatians 17, 7. Let's all stand to our feet. Verse 9. I shared this last week, but it's definitely appropriate after this story. Which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert. Everybody say pervert. Pervert the good news of Christ. And it is good news. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you, then what we have preached to you, let him be anathema. Let him be accursed. I wish to heaven that young prophet from Judah, had known this scripture. Would have saved his life. Amen? Why am I going to listen to an angel talking to you about my life when I can hear from God myself? Amen? Amen. Let me say that again. Why am I going to listen to an angel or a prophet or anybody else talking about my life when I can hear from the Holy Spirit? So that means any words of prophecy that come need to confirm what I'm already hearing from the Holy Spirit. See, if that prophet come and said, hey, you know, I had a uh, vision where you weren't supposed to come and stop for anything and eat or drink, and here you are under an oak tree, you stopped, you weren't supposed to, you should keep going, that would have confirmed the word of the Holy Spirit to him, amen? But that's not how the devil works. He comes to steal to rob, to destroy, and to kill our life. We need to get our heart in the Word of God. Amen? Every head bowed, every eye